Uh, Dr. Damari gave us a presentation on upfront therapy for aggressive T cell lymphoma. I wonder if you could summarize the presentation and tell us where we're going. What are the next steps with our therapeutic approach upfront? Um, well, in the presentation, I tried to uh, describe the scenario of a first line setting, as you mentioned, uh, where the new drugs that are mainly tested in the relapsed refractory setting uh, will be um, um, appropriate to be placed. Um, there are some uh, observations that we uh, can, can uh, uh, point at in, in the first line scenario of peripheral T cell lymphomas, the uh, systemic ones, which I was uh, touching upon in my presentation. Uh, the fact that uh, peripheral T cell lymphomas are a much more heterogeneous group of distinct biological entities, as opposed to, for example, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is often bro brought into the picture as a comparator. Um, and also their rarity is challenging when we have to make uh, summaries of uh, the results we obtain with our conventional approaches. Another important thing to mention is that most of the results we have obta obtained are generated in patients that uh, are mostly fit to receive some combination therapies that are uh, with a curative intent or even upfront uh, consolidation with autologous transplant. But when one looks at real world data of peripheral T cell lymphoma, it is obvious that approximately 50% of the entire population will not be eligible for that kind of approach. So that is has to be regarded as a hugely uh, existing uh, unmet clinical need. Uh, what I then uh, presented was the results of, uh, for example, our Nordic uh, lymphoma group studies that not only gave some volume in terms of number of patients, allowing to look at distinct subtypes behavior, but also in the long-term follow-up of those studies, how they behave, who are the long-term responders, and when do failures occur. So that pattern uh, educated us in terms of looking at a pattern of behavior, and, and now it's pretty clear that a third of the patients never make it through an induction. Uh, these are the primary refractory ones, and we must uh, realize that there are presently no uh, efficacious treatment options for those patients. Another third is chemo sensitivity in the beginning, response to induction treatment, even uh, uh, getting into a complete response uh, determined by the uh, criteria of the specific study, but then eventually relapses either early within one year from, for example, stem cell transplant or uh, late. We have been following these patients with a median follow-up of 10 years and, and see that around 10, 12% of the patients have a late relapse defined as uh, more than two years after stem cell transplant. But at the end of the day, we realize that 40% of the patients that we initially included are actually long-term remitters still in first complete remission. So it is uh, rather important to identify those. Well, I was going to ask you the question as to whether we can pick the winners from the losers at the beginning. Exactly. That is one of the paramount questions that is, uh, uh, is filling the agenda right now because the trial is done, the results of the trial, the result of the follow-up uh, are, uh, are there. So now it's trying to correlate biological features from trial-specific material with this uniform therapeutic background and try to discriminate the good doers from the bad doers in biological terms. You also touched on a study where they, uh, and this study was done by the German group, where they tried allogeneic transplant versus autologous transplant as consolidation and first remission. Can you just briefly tell us a little bit about that trial? Yes, that trial was a very interesting and a brave trial, I would say, from the German group, uh, uh, addressing the core question of is allogeneic transplant moved up front after an induction treatment, something that increases the number of cures, if you want, uh, after induction. And uh, we certainly can see in the retrospective and prospective data that there is a graft versus lymphoma effect. That, that I think is rather obvious. What is problematic and what made uh, the trial actually being stopped prematurely 
is that there is a treatment-related mortality with the allogeneic approach, which uh, counteracts the uh, advantages you can get from the graft versus lymphoma effect. And, and uh, the trial didn't pass the futility analysis, which was planned at first interim and was prematurely closed for this reason. There are some other upfront approaches that, that are um, currently underway, uh, utilizing novel agents upfront with chemotherapy. Can you just go into some of those trials for us? Yes. I just, during my talk, uh, pointed at three examples. The example of an early 2005 six uh, designed trial uh, from the Nordic group, uh, testing the addition of alemtuzumab to a CHOP backbone and consolidated in younger patients with high-dose therapy, and in elderly patients, just uh, observation after induction. That trial is now in the process of being uh, analyzed with a final analysis. Uh, <clears throat> the biological supervised CD52 uh, associated anal part of the analysis is still ongoing. The other two examples uh, in the frontline setting was where the, the, the Echelon 2 trial, the trial testing the uh, addition of brentoximab vedotin to a CHOP-like combination where the vinca alkaloid is taken out of the combination and, uh, and replaced by brentoximab vedotin versus uh, CHOP. And the third example, uh, the uh, romidepsin CHOP trial where the combination of romidepsin and CHOP is uh, <coughs> compared to CHOP uh, alone. 